Perfect. So welcome to One Night Stand. My name is Paula Santos and I am here with Allison Amick. She's our chief curator at Intuit, uh, the Center for Intuitive and Outsider Art. Uh, we are in Chicago and I think a few of you are definitely here in the city and welcome to all of you who are uh, following along from other parts of the country that has been a really wonderful thing about being able to do online public programs. Uh, today we will be talking about the very uh, beloved, uh, well-regarded uh, artist Bill Trailer, and as I have spent time with his work over the past few weeks, I can see why he keeps pulling people in over and over, <laughs> over years um, and generations. So uh, I'm so glad that we are here together to talk about his work. So uh, we will only be together for about 30 minutes. Um, and in this amount of time, we will be talking about one work of art. Um, we will be talking a little bit about uh, Bill Trailer's work. Um, overall, and uh, some of his story about, you know, him becoming an artist and such. Uh, I will ask you questions uh, related to what you notice, what you're thinking when you look, about, look at the work, and we will definitely have time for questions. So I'm going to begin sharing my screen. Um, Allison, I think you're gonna help me with the chat just in case I miss anything. Uh, when I ask questions, um, and once I share my screen, uh, please feel free to put comments in the chat uh, and Allison will alert me to them or I'll read them. Uh, there also be points where you would be able to unmute yourself and you know talk to me directly. So I'm gonna begin sharing my screen now. So here we have an image of Bill Trailer, and uh, there are a few images floating around of a trailer in front of um, this shop um, on the streets in Montgomery. And he is seen with pencil in hand, um, sometimes with paint in hand, creating the pictures uh, that um, are familiar to many of you and are definitely very familiar to us at Intuit. Uh, right now, we have a show called Outsider Art, the collection of Victor F. Keen, and we're very lucky to have uh, many works by Bill Trailer on our wall. So if you're local, um, you are able to visit us um, with time ticketing and you know all the precautions necessary uh, due to our uh, current uh, climate. Uh, so I'm going to start with the work of art itself. And my first question to you is a very simple one, but often one that, especially us that like to read about works of art, maybe don't ask ourselves, which is what details do you notice about this work? And like I said, you can use, sorry, you can use the chat uh, primarily, or you can unmute yourself if you have a comment you'd like to share. What do you notice? We have a very quiet room today. Silhouettes, yes, thank you, Dana. So yes, yeah, so we have uh, figures here. Um, these three human figures, and then we have these two animal figures that are uh, drawn and painted in like a silhouette type um, of way, you know, with this kind of dark black, absolutely. 
Yeah, so um, Dana noticed those silhouettes, which were, I said they were black, but then at the very, very top of this uh, picture, you have this figure here that's wearing this red shirt and is like reaching out sort of towards this animal. And you're noticing this gesture of this kind of reaching out, you know, and um, as I was looking at this work, um, I noticed, of course, the striking red at the top, but then once you look down here, it's almost like that gesture is repeated with this figure here also reaching out with this palm extended. So, you know, trailer gives us that gesture once again. Um, there are definitely some very, very big eyes. Um, the eye that I, my, my eyes are always drawn to are the eyes of this central figure here. That's, they're peering, they're like very widely looking at what's happening right up here. Now, does anyone have um, an idea of perhaps what's happening in this picture? Yeah, so um, a couple of things come to mind, right? That uh, especially because we have this figure here in the center that seems to have a weapon, perhaps a rifle, um, the idea of a hunt comes up, of perhaps they're hunting this animal that's here, perhaps these, or this dog here is helping with the hunt. Um, Deb also had this idea that uh, perhaps this man or this man um, is after a thief, or rather, I should say this man or this man are after a thief. Now, um, what, what makes you think thief, Deb or anyone? Why, why use that word? What are some of the details trailer gives us here? Well, we have a comment from Jamie that a white person is stealing the turkey. Mm. Yeah, so uh, I'm, it's such an interesting detail because you have here um, uh, the central figure all black, right, including their face. And then you have another figure here where you do have um, the outline of a face, but it's not uh, drawn in in that heavy black. And again here, so perhaps we're thinking this might be someone who's white. Um, and like Deb said, there was this red shirt, which also makes them like a, perhaps a different type of figure or like a, a there's a particular um, message here um, related to them. And several have also observed that the gun looks aimed at the figure grabbing the animal uh, by the neck and uh, not the bird. Yeah, so it, it begs the question perhaps like if we're thinking about hunting, who is being hunted here? Uh, who is being sought here? Uh, that's definitely something that Trailer is asking us um, by the way that he has depicted these figures. Let me ask you this. What are some of the questions that come up as you look at this picture? Mm -hmm. So I saw that Catherine says, um, why does the bottom person look uh, more like a spirit? Uh, and why do some figures have faces that are not filled in? And is the hunter a good guy or a bad guy? So um, I'll start with this figure down here, the one that I 
uh, initially talked about how it has that kind of mirror image of the reaching. Um, I think it's interesting that you mentioned that it looks like a spirit. And um, Catherine, I don't know if you are able to unmute yourself, but um, if you are, can you share with us what visual details makes you think it looks like a spirit? Well, it's not shaped like the other guys exactly. And the hands are like long and grasping. Like when I draw ghosty things, I, I make them more claw-like, like that. Yeah, I think your description of claw-like is definitely something you can see here because you have these very, very long fingers. And even the, the hand that's not reaching down here um, also has those very, very long reaching fingers. Uh, and, you know, in trailer's work, um, sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish between the figures who are, you know, depicting humans that are doing things and um, more specter-like or most more ghostly uh, figures that may represent um, perhaps um, an idea, uh, whether it's like an idea of mortality, an idea of morality, um, uh, trailer uh, was familiar with um, uh, some of the traditions of um, hoodoo beliefs, um, which were uh, in his part of Alabama, um, where he grew up and where he um, began doing work. Um, many of the enslaved people there practiced hoodoo. Uh, so this idea of specters and maybe ghosts or other worldly figures um, can you know, be seen in uh, the work. Um, and in this one, you know, we can imagine that perhaps this figure, you know, talks to that experience. Uh, so Deb asked the question, why do some figures have faces not filled in? And is the hunter a good guy or a bad guy? Now, I, as I look at this, um, I wonder the same things. So we can think about some details in the picture, but we can also think about some of the historical context uh, in which a trailer was creating his work. So trailer was an artist that lived during a time where the United States was uh, in a tumultuous endeavor to <laughs> rebuild itself as a nation. And what I mean by that is he was born um, into a family that was enslaved. And for the first years of his life, uh, he was enslaved himself, of course. And then the South um, lost the war and the Emancipation Proclamation, um, you know, persevered and uh, eventually the trailer family was freed. Now, like many other enslaved people working in plantations, uh, freedom came at different times and in different ways. Uh, since plantation owners did not necessarily give in to these uh, ideas of freedom um, without putting up resistance, uh, it was quite difficult for many formerly enslaved families uh, to either move away, um, to leave what they have known for generations. So the trailer family did end up um, staying um, at a plantation working, um, continuing to work. They did some sharecropping, of course, um, like many, many other formerly enslaved people uh, in, in the South. And Trailer himself, um, uh, one of the things I really loved uh, when I was reading about him was that uh, he, you know, there were many other sharecroppers that, uh, you know, went all into cash crops, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, 
cotton, things that like generated income, uh, but trailers uh, had many animals um, which helped feed his family. So of course, you know, he did a little bit of everything. Um, I guess in today's world, we would be like, he diversified um, his, his uh, agricultural investment. Uh, so he was able to care for what ended up being a very, very large family. Um, the reason I bring up this background on him is that he began creating works of art much, much, much later in his life. Uh, he lived um, into uh, the early 1940s and he began drawing or making pictures in 1939. So he was already, let's say, I think around 86 years old. So by that time, uh, he was living in Montgomery. He left um, the rural life that he had once uh, lived. Um, uh, he was getting older, so of course he couldn't work the land in the way that um, he, he could in his youth. And when he began making pictures, a lot of the symbols, a lot of the images that are in his work recall a, a more rural life. And you can look at it at the, from the lens of perhaps this is a hunt, right? Perhaps we're hunting for turkeys or we're hunting for chickens, or perhaps this is someone who came on his farm and tried to steal a chicken, or perhaps it's someone, a story he heard of someone trying to steal a chicken. So that's definitely one lens to look at it from. The other lens, which I was just telling Allison that is a very, very interesting one is that the symbol of a man with a rifle and this dog that is also in pursuit carry a lot of weight when you take into consideration uh, slavery and how plantation owners and slaveholders would uh, essentially hunt for runaway slaves. Um, I am going to go into a little bit of the detail work here, specifically here um, of this figure of the dog. Um, the dog, appears a lot in Trailer's work and, and it could be in sort of very various uh, ways. This is seems like a very like small dog. You can almost hear it barking, you know, and, and we also hear it reaching. Um, if we look at the lens of perhaps this is a chase against a thief, you know, the imagery of this dog then becomes maybe perhaps a little bit darker a little bit uh, more menacing. Um, if we think about it in terms of, you know, a hunt, like you would hunt for turkey, wild turkey or whatever it is, um, then perhaps it's more of a, you know, a dog is helpful, right? In trying to scope out um, different types of fowl. Um, and uh, yeah. That's where I'll leave it with that lens with the symbolism. Now, uh, let me look at the, what Annie and Francis have said. So Annie says, I'm curious about Bill Trailer's composition and his placement of the figures so high above and down below. Uh, yes, yeah, so let me go back to here. Uh, often, one of the more, most striking things about Trailer's work, especially knowing that he completely taught himself how to create these pictures, he had, you know, a, he had pencils, he had a water, a water based paint, so um, which you would call poster paint. Um, sometimes he used crayons. Uh, he used space in a way that lets us as a viewer inhabit the space with him. Now, um, Annie, um, if you can unmute yourself, I don't know if you have that capability, 
can you tell me um, what about this composition here uh, drew your attention? Uh, sure. Um, <laughs> well, I think it's an unusual placement of the figures, I guess. So, you know, if he was telling a story about a person being hunted, I would think that um, like a horizontal depiction might communicate that story, but here he chose to create a vertical composition with someone above him, like as if the person was maybe even in an attic. Um, I'm not really sure. And then I'm just so curious. I don't really have any ideas. I would be interested in hearing what other people have to say about the figure below underneath the dog. Mm -hmm. And you know how bent the figure is and how stretched out the figure is. Um, yeah. Thank you, Annie. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think um, the you're noticing that the the and this is uh, again to this idea of the rifle and who's being like who this rifle is being pointed at, right? Like there's pointing straight up, and the composition is that the thief or the person who's running away with this chicken is almost like on this ledge or like shelf mm -hmm. uh, type of a structure. Um, and you can read it in, in that way, but then you can also perhaps read it like that they're on the ground, like th they're touching like earth. Uh, but then that puts into question, well, why are these figures here you know, essentially floating in space, you know, like if he put ground or this ledge where um, these, this action's happening, the ones down here are in this kind of more of an abyss <laughs> of space um, as like silhouettes as well. Uh, if you look at um, and I'll and I'll show you more examples of his work, um, he used space uh, in really sophisticated ways and in very modernist ways, where the surface becomes really really flat, and then he's able to carve out the space in whichever way he can, uh, which in whichever way he wants, uh, without really thinking about you know how maybe we would think about perspective, right? Like you, Annie said, like, well, why is it above? Why and is it right next to you? Right, right next to the rifle. Like there is a possibility where trailer could have shifted this, you know, rectangle sheet of cardboard and put it the other way, you know, and then done the composition in that way. Um, but he chose to have this, um, the energy you know, flowing upward. Um, and that is where all of that reaching kind of goes to this top ledge here. Uh, Catherine, that's an interesting idea. Uh, <laughs> uh, Catherine says, uh, could the top figure be in a different plane of existence? Uh, I think the answer is quite possibly yes. Uh, in trailers, pictures, you'll often see um, events, narratives that are happening concurrently. So perhaps maybe the way to read this is that this um, action with the rifle and the dog um, and this, you know, perhaps more specter-like figure down there um, is separate from what's happening on that ledge and trailer is giving us that division, right? It's just that he used the same surface, the same, um, these two images together to maybe give us another meaning um, and not necessarily, you know, not necessarily kind of like comic book style, right? Where it's like, we have one image and then we have another image. Uh, so I think like that's a quite, also a possibility. And, I, and I'll show you some examples where maybe that's a little bit um, clearer. Uh, Francis, I wanna get back to your comment 
Um, and are you able to unmute yourself so you can tell me a little bit more about what you mean about this is a reversal of the owner slash, is it love trope? Slave. Slave, Slave. okay. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean here? Well, we haven't talked at all about the fact that the person with the rifle is in blackface and the other two figures are in whiteface. So it's obviously a racial situation here. Um, and with the fact with the, the man with the gun, the, the person with the gun is black and the person who potential victim of the gun is white, which is technically a reversal of the, of the, of the slave or the freed slave stealing food because they're not able to provide for themselves after, after the um, uh, civil war. Civil war. So, uh, you know, nobody's really talked about the fact. You know, we're talking about the faces not being filled in, but there are obviously white faces and black faces. Uh, yeah. Thank you for uh, bringing us to that point, Francis. I think like that's uh, such a fascinating way to read this about how the power dynamic is being shifted here. Yep. Um, in the way that trailer depicts, you know, um, you know, if we say mm -hmm. that the middle figure here is the slave owner, um, except trailer depicts him as black and the thief um, as white, you know, that's a complete change of the power dynamic that was prevalent, oppressive and radically violent throughout trailers life. Um, it is a way to maybe take that power, you know, and maybe some of the pain that um, a formerly enslaved people were, had to suffer, you know, like Francis said, perhaps they weren't able to feed their families, perhaps they weren't able to feed themselves. Um, there was uh, part of the reason why he stopped sharecropping too and, and moved um, uh, was because uh, there were some fallow years um, in um, his part of Alabama. So there was hardship. That was incredible hardship uh, while he was, uh, you know, alive. So I think that's a really interesting dynamic. It's also a really interesting dynamic because I was just um, looking at another work of art where uh, he uh, depicts a really, really gigantic dog, um, you know, like very, and like the teeth are bared, but then you have a white figure with like a leash um, that's maybe like a a fourth of the size of the dog. So playing around with like those power dynamics, uh, playing around with this, the scale of terror, you know, as well is something that, um, that can be read in his work um, if you're taking that lens. Uh, let's look at, here's a little bit of a close up of that figure here and, uh, I I love how the red like seeps into the black here um, with this chicken here. Uh, I don't know, I don't think I mentioned this, but uh, trailer preferred uh, to uh, make his pictures on cardboard um, and the cardboard would come from uh, packaging, um, sometimes advertisements, things like that. If you go to um, the Bethany Mission Gallery page, um, there's uh, photographs of like the backs of some of the works. Um, and, you know, it'll be advertisements related to the time when, obviously when he was alive. So that in and of itself is um, interesting to look at as ephemera. Uh, uh, here is the reaching figure here, um, who is, you know, if we take Francis's lens, is a white person, a white specter, a white um, other being um, here. And here we have the central figure um, aiming at uh, 
the the thief up above. So let me check the time. Okay, uh, we're almost just about done. Um, I would just want to walk you through a few more um, examples. So this idea of the chase um, is one that keeps coming up in trailers work. And if you are ever, I think maybe some of you um, hopefully got to go to the trailer show at the Smithsonian, like about a couple of years ago, there's a lot of um, media out there uh, related to that show. Um, and then there's a lot of um, talks around what the chase means uh, in trailers work. And here we have the figure of a rabbit, um, which was uh, seen as a figure that, you know, tricked uh, people that was clever, that was able to persevere um, against far more, um, far bigger people and far bigger threats. Um, and here again, you have these figures here, you have the another like the hat, the hat of this perhaps slave owner is, you know, fell off his head. And then you have this person who's running away. And again, you have that like reach that very like, um, dance like reach here. Um, here, uh, I wanted to show this is also um, add into it, I believe, I think still on the walls um, from Victor F. Keen's collection, where you have, it's a very, very different subject matter. We have uh, two drinks here and another, um, I guess, motif that comes up in trailer's work is drinking. So like merriment and drinking, but, the, but then also the pitfalls of drinking uh, and I just saw some of the parallels between using like this ledge, for example, you know, that like it here like is a type of shelf, right? And that these figures are um, hanging from this ledge or, or reaching towards um, the drinks. Um, in this one, this is from the Smithsonian, uh, you have this cardboard, uh, that is shaped uh, in a very peculiar way, actually. Um, and you have a very similar uh, scene where you have a dog here, you have two uh, slave owners here. Uh, one is pointing and one is in the house and one is here with a gun, except this time the chicken or the bird is flying away, you know, it, it, it has its uh, wings like spread out, you know, and uh, perhaps it, when I look at this, I think, oh, this bird is actually going to be free. Like, like they're not going to catch this bird. Um, you may have a different interpretation of that, but uh, I also really like how um, he used this piece of cardboard that said radio here. He um, didn't read or write. So um, him putting his thoughts and ideas in this like lyrical way on uh, as works of art uh, was a super powerful um, just way of existing in the world um, at a time when it was, you know, a difficult um, existence. Uh, one last thing I'll say is um, that I, I keep using the word lens and I believe it was, I heard Leslie Umberger use that word lens, which I think is so useful because it's not as if Bill Trailer told us, this is what these symbols mean. And we're also not his contemporaries. So we don't have that same cultural context for what he lived through. And beyond that, you know, I'm not black. So I also am even removed from that ancestral experience, that ancestral um, knowledge that comes with um, having that 
um, history of enslavement um, in your family. And this was really important because he, he wasn't able to just say like, there was injustice and brutality um, on the plantations because that put his life at risk. So he had to find ways to make sure that people who were looking at his images were able to read them, but then also make sure that if especially white people who wanted to harm him were actually not really able to read them in like a sure way. Uh, so there is um, the word that we use is like code switching, you know, the symbolism through code switching. Um, so I'll stop talking now. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, we only really scratched the surface here um, with trailer, but I'm so glad that uh, all of you participated. So any questions? Well, I'm glad that I, I touched on everything um, that you wanted to discuss. And thank you so much uh, for being here with me. And hopefully you'll have a really great evening. And we will see you actually next year with this series. This was our last one for 2020. And we will be definitely very happy to come back um, and talk more deeply about art in 2021. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>